and that's a good use of time. All right, so our next speaker is Michael Machiarlotti, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, and his talk was titled Longitudinal Changes in Male Distance Running Performance, 2001 to 2017. Michael is a PhD candidate planning at the, uh, studying at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center with a degree in biostatistics. He has a background in applied math and statistics, and his areas of interest in statistics are sampling theory, missing data analysis, applied modeling, and computational statistics. Michael's a big sports fan and has been exploring sports analytics as it combines his love for sports and statistics. And in any minute now, we'll have Michael Magiarlotti ready to go. I promise I'll be quick. I'll try to get through some of the basic stuff just so we can get to the results. Why don't you just go ahead? Technology is great until it's not. Does it smell like that? Is it just not? Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So, I think you all know what the topic is. Is there. Is it, is it turn off? Is it turn off? Oh, uh, yes, it's Yeah, perfect. You just do this for I mean, I can just stand right here. That's fine. So what this topic or what this talk is going to include is an intro and back, uh, in background question of interest. I'll go over the statistical methods used and the data, and then you know we really want to just get to the results probably and see what we find, and then just discussion and further research. That's it. Oh, there we go. So. Um, distance running performance, I mean, we know it's relatively dynamic, so I'm just going to give you a couple of illustrations. So I think a lot of people know about Roger Bannister breaking the four minute miles. So there's a picture of him doing that. So he did that in 1954. The first person under 350 was John Walker, and it's roughly 20 years later. And then currently, Hisham El Garouge has, has the mile world record at about 343. Um, and I, I, the title said it's, it's male distance running, and I'll talk about that in a little bit later. But, um, in the 5,000, Gunder Hag was the first person under 14 minutes. He did that in 1942. 20 years later, Ron Clark, another significant improvement, was under 1330. Saeed Awida was the first person under 13. And then currently, Kenan uh, Nisa of Bekula, or Bekula is the current world record is 1237.35. So that's like, if anyone knows anything about running, that's about four minutes per 1,600 meters three times over, so if you go to your high school state meet, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, in the marathon, the first person under 220 was Jim Peters in 1953, Ron Hill, first person under 210 in 1970, Dennis Cometo is the current world record holder at 20, just a, a shade under 203, and then are any of you guys familiar with the sub two hour attempt that just happened recently? So this is an unofficial world record because it didn't occur on a certified course and there were pacers, but uh, Eliud Kipchoge ran about 2 flat 25, which is about 434 per mile for 26.2 miles. It's ridiculous, yep. So if we look at some of the world records by gender, so I'm including all events here, but I mean, the, the focus of this research in this per, per today and then this topic is going to be on the distance events. So it's got the current world records and then it also has by the age. Um, so I put the men and women side by side there just to give you kind of a comparison of things. So I think that it's pretty reasonable to say that when people perform well in, in something like track and field, we're curious about why. And then I think uh, as a follow-up to that, when you go in and you see outstanding performances, one of the questions now currently, I think, is, is it legitimate? So, as I said, uh, I, uh, unfortunately, I don't get to go into that as much as I want to today, but I'm going to come out with this paper, and hopefully I'll have something that's a little bit more definitive on that. 
So and the last thing that I want to show you before we get into the, the particular analysis that I looked at to go in and, and examine the distance learning uh, performances from 2001 to 2017 was just the progression of the, the marathon world record. And this is for men. So if you look at that, as I said, I, I, another safe assumption is over time, the, the distance running events, and I think the track and field events, you're going to see increased performance. Now, what you also see is varied differences over time as well. Does that make sense? Like, you're, sometimes you see drastic drops, and other times you see relative lulls. So the question probably is, is why is that variability taking place? So that's going to be something that I'll examine as well. So, so why did this topic interest me? Well, first I was a distance runner in college, so I don't look it, but I am 41. Um, so long past my prime, I think, uh, especially since I'm not running as much. But, you know, I was very interested in the history of the sport. So if you go back to the 50s and the 70s, there was relative dominance by, like, Australia, New Zealand, and the U.S. In the 70s, uh, a relative, I, I mean, you could call it an African surge took place. And you can almost argue that currently there's probably... Uh, still dominance by African nations, where I think recently, you know, if you look at things from the U.S. and from a, maybe a Western perspective, there's been a relative parity in the last 10 or 15 years, where you've seen um, Western athletes, um, some of them not native, go in and perform relatively well at some, some of the championship events. So this got me thinking, well, what is really happening in the recent past? Can we look at those performances and see any trends? And are, are there are anything indications of like what might contribute to performance? Um, another thing too, because I think that this is something that the people that do distance running, you know, that in Japanese culture, distance running is like highly esteemed. So do you guys know like about Akitans and then um, like the high school and university competitions and the corporate teams are. So there's there's these huge. Uh, huge national competition. So just as an example, uh, I mean, if you know anything about a 5K for boys, if you run under 15 minutes, it's ridiculously fast. In Japan, uh, some of the times that you see there, for, from a US perspective, they're, they're really relatively modest um, if you go into the Japanese running scene. So as an example, in 2014, 11 boys had 5K PRs faster than 14 minutes. So the fastest being 13.35. Of the top 12 teams that were in this national uh, Ikidian championships, um, the seven-man averages were all under 14.30. So most of these people that are just on average teams would go into the states in the U.S. and they would clean up. They'd be winning state championships, average people. So. <clears throat> As these trends happen, I think sometimes people think of like the 50s, 60s, and the 70s as the golden era of running. And there were studies that really went in and tried to examine performance. So I, you know, as recently as two days ago, these are kind of the most, you, you do a Google search of distance running performances, and these are the most highly cited papers. So um, looking at lactate accumulation and distance running performance, so that was had 837 citations, running economy and distance, so I think a lot of the early studies looked at you know, lactate threshold and then running economy and how that changed. So 840 citations, and then uh, David Costell's paper, the fractional utilization of aerobic capacity during distance, um, 704 citations. And if you look at a lot of these studies, as I said, they occur in like the 70s and the 80s. So, if you look more recently, they've started to you've started to see performance papers where they go in and they try to assess distance running performance. So um, a lot of them are discipline specific. So something about this research that's a little bit different is it's when you say distance running, and that'll be one of the first things that I talk about. Uh, that's not really discipline specific necessarily. So what I really want to look at is are there trends in performance with men distance running? Are there variables that are readily available, like on the IAAF, web, IAAF website, that are related to performance? And then given that we know there's a monetary aspect in performance, can we use any of these things to, that, to indicate doping? So data was obtained from the IAAF, so I had access to this information. I'm currently trying to find more because I'd really like to advance this study, and, I, and we'll talk about that in the limitations. Um, exclusion criteria was if you didn't have a date of birth, but I took the 5K and the 10K on the track, the half marathon and the marathon. So it is limited, and I think in future iterations of this, when I write the paper, I'm going to include more of this. 
But the reason that I chose these is due to the pro, pro, uh, or the abundance of information. The variables reported on this website, so you get the competitor, the mark, the rank, the venue, the nationality, the date of birth, and the date of the performance and position in the race. So the measure that I use to compare across all these things, because this really isn't a trivial thing. If you're going in, you want to look across events, the question is, how do I compare them? So I just used Jack Daniel's VDOT, and I converted everything to a VDOT. So if you don't know anything about that, you can check that out. But it's, it's based on that lactate threshold. It's the velocity that you're, you're running at your lactate threshold. So the outcome of interest, as I said, was VDOT. I didn't do any age adjustments, and if you the reason I did that is I want to include age in my model. The covariates that I used were age, nationality. I broke it up into those nationalities. Uh, so USA, Kenya, Japan, Ethiopia, China, and Russia, other African nations, and then just other. But we have the events, we have the years, and then for simplicity, so we'll talk about the longitudinal model that I used here. But if you go in and you just use every single nation, your model's just going to be huge. So I had to kind of make strategic decisions to make the model estimable. Um, I also put in seasons because you know that sometimes people peak for different events. So something that, that I think that will evolve from this is also looking at within a given season, how do performances change? Does that make sense? So I'll talk about this as well. And then whether it's a championship year or not, so if anyone follows running, you know that during championship years, Athletes tend to go in and chase time. During championship time, they tend to chase medals. So that was the reason for that. Now, the time that we use in this, so when you're doing a longitudinal study, you have repeated measures on some object, person, or something like this, and you have to have a time measurement. So although we have the years, we're really looking at the time that I've got you inside of my study. Does that make sense? So when they have a performance that's on the IAA, IAAF website, that's, that's when I'm tracking you. So the general setup, so as I said, I don't really care to go into it. I just did a, a, a fixed effects model, so I didn't go into a random effects, but I'll, I think later on when I go into the limitations, when I want to investigate doping, I think you're going to have to go into a random effects model, and I'll explain that later. Um, the seven covariates that I had, the individuals that we have across all those years is 8,589. The number of measures, so the, the most that you can have, the most that any one person was inside of the study was 145 performance measures. Um, so if you look at this, some people, if you only made the IAAF chart one year, I have you for one measure. If you made it multiple times, I have you for multiple measures. So it's an unbalanced design. So with that being said, you know that in a longitudinal study, the covariate structure is extremely important for getting reliable estimates inside of your model. Um, so with, in doing that, I did use an AR1, but I compared different covariate structures. It seemed to be relatively stable. The other thing to recall about this, however, is the the covariance matrix, matrix when you have a lot of observations, is, is generally robust to uh, deviations from its specifications. So I didn't really find any issues there. So what are we going to look at? So as I said, now that we're getting into this, what did you find? All right, well, we're getting there. But we obviously have to get into setup. So I do have some basic summary statistics. You can just get a general sense of how people performed. What were the nations? What were the events over time? And then this is just essentially how I developed my model. So as I said, I did a longitudinal fixed effects. The outcome was VDOT. I did essentially a purposeful selection. So if you're familiar with Hosmer and Lemeshow, their purposeful selection in like um, uh, longitudinal studies, so survival analysis, longitudinal studies, and like categorical analysis. You basically screen in variables that are, you cast kind of a broad net, and then after you've done that, you do a backwards selection, and then you just kind of develop your model from there. Um, so those were the criteria we were using. Now, as I said, the biggest thing about this too is, if you're doing a longitudinal study, you want to see how performance changes over time. Does that make sense? That's the biggest question. So you really, when you're developing your model, although if I went back a slide, it looks like, oh, they're, they're all linear effects, they're not. The biggest thing you want to look at is that time variable interaction. So we did, I did find something interesting there. So in any case, the summary statistics that we have, so if you just wanted to look at overall average VDOT and then the ages by year, so it's not super interesting. But if you wanted to look at it, it's relatively straightforward. There's not too much going on from year to year to year. Um, if we look at the different countries, if you just wanted to see how they were represented 
uh, overall. So of all the, I have about 83,000 observations inside of the study, but the USA compromised about 10, and then you can kind of see a breakdown uh, based on the stratification that I used there. And then by seasons, it's relatively equivalent, but you know, with the main track season having a little bit more observations. And then if we look at this, there's kind of a good smattering of events uh, across the different years and overall. So what did I find? So the first thing that's interesting, but I don't think it's, this wasn't really surprising, that when you look at just no other covariates, just time, you find a quadratic time trend with B dot and time inside of the study. So time is kind of a proxy for age, right? Because the longer you're in the study, the older you have to be. So if you see a quadratic trend, and the quadratic trend was you know, increasing and then decreasing, what does that imply? So this is the, we'll be interactive a little bit, because as I said, when we were going through this stuff, what does that mean? The older you get, the, slower, you the slower. So you're gonna reach a peak, and then on average, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna get slower. But why this matters is when you first look at this time trend, th these are the time effects that I want to look at with each of these covariates. So you can well imagine my model gets really large because not only am I looking at the linear time trend, I'm also looking at the quadratic time trend. So <coughs> the final model, so as I said, I just did the, the type three effects overall because just real quickly so I can explain this and then we'll look at the, each of the results. So, um, because um, you're looking at a quadratic trend, I centered the time, because that's pretty common when you go in and you have uh, uh, like polynomial effects or you're looking at two variables that are inside of a model, you don't want them to be collinear. But if I were looking at something like center time and country, there's seven terms there, but really six because you have a reference variable. Does that make sense? So if you're really thinking about how large this model is, it's showing you each of the main covariates, um, then there's the quadratic term, then those are the interaction terms. And then um, I also looked, because to me this was also interesting, if I could find an age interaction by different variables. So what I found that was significant were time interactions with age, country, year, season, and event. Time squared interactions with age, year, and event. And then age interactions with country, year, and event. And everyone says, well, what does that mean? I know, looking at this model, it's extremely complex. So longitudinal models, if you're going in and you're looking at it, are difficult to look at. So to go in and get the individual effects by each of these things, you have to take the derivative. So obviously, what am I going to do? We're going to look at pictures. So we know there's quadratic effects. So we know we're not going to see parallel trends in general for most things. So what did we find? So if I look at the smooth predicted V dot by nation, what do we find? So the USA is blue. Kenya is red, and this is Ethiopia. So what does this really say? That Ethiopia, USA, can per and Kenya perform extremely well over time. And you see differing effects, right? So they're not parallel. So what's happening over time is you're seeing these differences. And you can well imagine that these differences, if they're parallel, it's just saying there's one time effect. So that makes sense, the linear. If you're seeing different ones, it's showing that the quadratic is showing up more. Um, and then another interesting thing, so we talked about Japan. So Japan is this one. Japan starts off r relatively high, in fact, even higher than the US, but then what happens over time? They don't tend to perform very well. And this is like, you go and you look at things, um, and people ask, well, where are the Japanese runners if they're performing so well in high school and they're not performing well later on? This is just kind of confirming that. Um, and then just as a frame of reference is, what does a V dot of 77 or that actually mean? So uh, these are averages, right? We're doing a fixed effect. So if we're looking at this, uh, a 77 implies a 13, 44, 5K, 28, 36, 10K, and 103 half marathon to 11. So if we look at it by year, what's happening? So to me, this is interesting. So what does this kind of suggest? So I broke it up into early year and late year. So recently there's been a bigger push by WADA and other agencies to go in and test for doping. Does that make sense? So what are you noticing? That late year, the late year studies, they're essentially different. So I think currently, I think there's been a, a, a notion that the stricter testing has been, we've been getting less doping cases recently. And this is kind of an indi indication of that. Does that make, does everyone 
I like nods too. I was a former teacher, everyone's like, hmm, are you sure? Okay. <laughs> so um, we also look by event, and this is actually counterintuitive, but then I, a reasonable explanation. So if we look at predicted VDOT by event over time, so the 5K and the 10K, they're relatively higher, whereas in the marathon, they're relatively lower. And I think that this makes good sense, however. So if you look at this, certainly recently, and then maybe even in the past, if you win a marathon, so people that run the 5K and 10K and they don't move up, they probably tend to stay in those events. But suppose if you are, you are a dominant athlete from Africa or these other nations, if you win a major marathon, or even a non-major marathon, that's life-changing money. Does that make sense? So the fact that you see these average predicted B dots, like they're they're higher early on in the study, but later on they di they just don't seem to be there. It's it, it's uh, essentially to me what this say is distance running is a young man's game. So this notion that you know older people they can be successful in the marathon and they're they're going to stay there. I think Jolindo Bourdain in the 1984 the Los Angeles Olympics he won a medal and everyone points to that and I'm saying that's an anomaly. And this is where I'd say so. Uh, I'm going to kind of move on. Is everyone clear on this? So I did the same thing because I think that when you look at this, it's more interesting to look at people's age. So I have, if you want to, in, in interest of time, if you want to look at this, I did the same thing and found relatively similar results. But the reason that I said this is more interesting is as opposed to looking at the time in the study, how are older and younger people faring after you're controlling for all these covariates? So here, like I said, it's kind of the same thing that Ethiopia and Kenya are performing quite well. The one interesting thing about this, and I, this was purposeful, Russia and China, they seem to have average performances to start, but at 35, they go up, and then Kenya has a slight decrease at 34. But I think that those are relatively commonly held notions, too, that the African athletes, they reach a peak at some years. You do have people like uh, Gabor Selassie and Paul Tergat and some other people that stay a little bit longer. but there seems to be a precipitous fall. But as I said, China and Russia, so everyone knows about the Russian doping scandal. It's not, probably didn't just happen in the Winter Olympics. So you look at this and there's, <laughs> I mean, that obviously defies trends. So in the US too, so I think there's been some concern too with what, what are Western US athletes do because they have access to better technologies. Similar things with age and years, exactly what we see. And then same thing across the events, but it just gives you a little bit better idea after you're just looking at age. Um, so just some limitations. I only considered four events, so I'd like to expand that. I don't have data on athletes before they attained the world list performance. So what I'm trying to do is expand to like the junior athletes, because if you're really trying to figure out what's happening over time and if people are doping, you really need how they progress over the years. So I, what I need to do is go back into the, the junior list as well. I only explored men, but I'm, we'll talk about what are future research questions. So I didn't include biological data. So I do have access to weight and height information, but those are only reported. So one of the things you realize too is uh, the weight of an athlete, it fluctuates over time. So if you don't really have that measure, that makes sense? You're, you're only gonna have a reported measure. So um, does anyone know Kenese Bekla is kind of increasing in distance? And there's a famous thing where two months before an event, he was 30 pounds overweight before he's gonna run a marathon and he lost 30 pounds. That heavily influences performance. So, um, you know, I think in follow-ups and especially in my in, in the, the paper that I do with this, the things that I might suggest to the IAAF is if you can get this ancillary information treated as, as a missing data problem, if you get access to it, it's going to really just augment your study and you're going to be able to catch suspect, suspected dopers much easier. Um, I only explored a linear model. So we did explore a quadratic trend with time, but I didn't consider nonlinear effects with but really that's only gonna affect age. So there's not really, I'm not really too worried about that, but I would be worried if we have some of these other continuous covariates. Um, the last thing, further research, obviously include other men, uh, other events. I wanna include women, so that's my next big thing. Um, along those same events, because I wanna look across gender, I wanna develop an instrument. So, I mean, this is where I'd say probably over the next four to six months after I finish my dissertation, this will probably be one of the first things that I go and take a look at because you really want a statistical instrument. And um, just to digress for a moment, so if you think about this, does everyone know what a screener is? Like if you do a screening test, it's not a conclusive thing. 
Does that make sense? So the, the gold standard for this is if I have your biological passport, I know if you've been doping or not. But to do that, that's expensive and time consuming. So what, I, what would really be of interest is to take this readily available performance data and maybe even um, some of these, this biometric data that might be able to be collected and use it as a screening device to say these are potential donors. Does that make sense? So that's where the, this research is going to kind of head. And then the last thing is, if we really want to predict individual performance, you have to consider a mixed model where you're considering like random effects, where, as I said, I only did population averages, but I mean, this can easily be extended to that. So these are some of the citations that I had inside of the study. So as I said, I'm, I'll happy, I'm happy to present these slides, and once I have a working paper done, I'm happy to share that. Um, Acknowledge acknowledgements, just my advisors at the HSC, one of them doesn't know I'm here, so, <laughs> so I'm not going to say that. Uh, the entire BSC department, faculty, staff, and students, the College of Public Health, my brother for reading over this stuff, so everything is centered, so I had him go in, he's not a statistician, but he went and helped me with that, so, but if there are any mistakes, there's his email, and then, um, <laughs> dark side of the force. So, that's kind of a running joke right now, the, the analytic side is the dark side of the force. In any case, you guys, any questions? Um, I'm going I'm to ask you if you do have any questions, yeah. talk to Michael uh, afterwards in the hallway or, or some other time, we want to keep it. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Michael, for your